Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nina. You might know me as a facilitator for the Graduate Facilitator for the Seminar, but today I also have the privilege to host uh, Dr. Uh, Ming Sung Wang. Uh, it's his first visit to Penn State. Uh, so, your thoughts as well? Uh, I've met Ming through my work uh, in the Patterson Lab, so he's the host Metabolite Microbiome Access. Some of you know we do a little bit of metabolomics in our group. <laughs> Ming received his Bachelor's of Science in Computer Engineering in 2009 from the University of Illinois, uh, followed by a PhD in Computer Science and Engineering, advised by the innovative Dr. Nuno uh, Bandera um, from UCSD in 2017, a postdoc fellowship with the Distinguished Dorsey Group at the Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and more, and more recently establishing his own research group at uh, University of California, Riverside in 2022. Uh, Ming's doctoral work included assembling uh, the massive KB uh, knowledge base, which is the largest proteomics uh, MSMS knowledge base using community data. And um, he also developed the crowdsourcing infrastructure for the Global Natural Products Social Molecular Networking, or GMPS for short, ecosystem. And not only did Ming build these amazing platforms, which provide us all with open source and open access knowledge, uh, but he also developed a statistical framework for comparing MSMS spectra, which many of you should, would know is pretty much the base of our analyses. And during his postdoctoral work, Ming led the development of several more computational tools enabling repository scale data analysis and the reuse of public data, which for the first time enabled users to search all metabolomics data sets, which as of this morning, there's a whopping 2,853 data sets um, available in the public knowledge base at GMPS, containing more than 2 million samples, ranging from serum to insects to terrestrial, marine, and even built environment samples. In addition to developing these tools, Ming has given more than 30 presentations and workshops, reaching thousands of in-person and hundreds of thousands of online users. And he has an impressive uh, 94 publications, I think, if I counted correctly. <laughs> <laughs> 46 of which are describing his computational tools, which are used uh, over 400,000 times a month. Ming is also a leader of the Collaborative Microbial Metabolite Center between uh, UC San Diego and Riverside, where they're building a broad microbial metabolite knowledge base and tools to aid the identification and characteriz characterization of bioactive microbial metabolites to better understand the functional role of microbiomes. Um, and with that, on behalf of the Microbiome Center, I would like to present you with this great plaque. Oh, well, well that, that's where it was great. Cool. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now I'll hand it over to Ming so he can share more about his excited work going to the world around us. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Nina. First of all, we do not give such long um, <laughs> introductions um, at Riverside, but no, that was wonderful. But if I had known, I would have just said, Sure, you know, it's, it's a little, yeah. Thank you so much, thank you, it's great. Um, well, thank you all and, and people on Zoom um, for, for coming today. Uh, I've just started my faculty journey a little over a year ago. And so this is one of my first talks outside of UC Riverside. So this is really special for me. Um, and it's great to have such a warm welcome. And so thank you all for that. Um, and so what I'll be talking about today and my background again is in computer science. Um, and so a lot of the computational tools and approaches couched in the framework of uh, chemical discovery. And so I don't wanna you know, lead you all on thinking that I actually know anything about real things. <laughs> I, I'm just a computer scientist who likes to do numbers, but I have some really great collaborators that really turn these algorithms and their approaches mm -hmm. into some real knowledge. So I definitely wanna have a shout out to that. But hopefully throughout this talk, we can, we can introduce you to some um, broad concepts that we've been working on um, over the past couple of years, and you will be able to connect it to how it might be useful to your work. So um, broadly, my, my expertise is in analyzing uh, untargeted metabolomics data. Um, and when we scale that up, what can we start doing and what we start finding? And so my disclosures, Just, oh, there we go. My disclosures are just here. just click on the screen with your mouse. Oh, we're good, we're good, we're good. So again, some of the areas that my collaborators, not me, my collaborators have worked on where untargeted metabolomics has been really useful 
things like the gut microbiome probably pretty relevant here, um, but also chemical ecology being from Southern California, uh, as well as drug discovery, drug metabolism, forensics, um, and oceanography, um, just as a, as a sampling. Um, but taking a step back instead of applications, kind of the core analytical chemistry question we start asking is, given some sort of biological, environmental, or chemical sample we want to analyze, we want to be able to measure what all the small molecules in there, and at the end of the day, be able to return some sort of structure, right? So we can say if we have caffeine or stenothricin or whatever uh, set of molecules that are actually present, we want to be able to detect it and identify it. That's one of the core questions that we want to address. And so the technique that we, that the, the field uses is mass spectrometry. And so just to get everybody on the same page, why do we use mass spectrometry specifically? And so it's high throughput. We can measure tens of thousands of molecules per hour. And these days it's, we're upping it by an order of magnitude. It can be quantitative. And there's a few asterisks around the, the level of quantification, uh, quantitation that you can do, um, as well as it's versatile. We can measure many different types of molecules in difference from technologies like sequencing, which measures one type of molecule. Uh, we can measure many different types. So that's, you know, I think mass spectrometry is very cool. Um, but that, that's some of the reasons why we, we go down that route. And so one of the things that uh, I want to point out here is with mass spectrometry, it's just a very fancy, very expensive scale, right? At the end of the day, instead of measuring onions, we start measuring molecules. And one of the, the problems that we have when we measure the entire molecule is uh, if the composition, the elemental composition is the same and they're isomers of each other, if we simply weigh the molecule, the measurement of the mass is indistinguishable um, depending if you rearrange the atoms, right? Just here's an example here on the bottom. On the left and the right hand side, same composition, we can't distinguish it. So one of the things that we do within mass spectrometry is we wanna get a little bit more information. And so one of the techniques to do that is, as an illustration here, we can take a particular molecule, we add some energy, and then it falls apart. Now it's gonna probably irk some chemists here, but at least my simplification, in my mind, some of the bonds in these uh, molecules are weaker and stronger than others. Kind of first rule, first approximation, the weaker bonds break first, and the bond strengths are dictated by how the molecule is put together. And so what we end up with is something like this. We can measure the masses, not of the full molecule, but of the pieces. And the pieces give us some sort of fingerprint and give us a reproducible fingerprint for that particular molecule. And kind of one of the basic assumptions, and it doesn't hold true in all cases, but different molecules yield different fragments. So that's, that's one thing just to keep in mind. And so just to recap on the type of data that we have, we start off with a full molecule and we can weigh it. We wanna know the full mass of the molecule. That's useful for us. Then we break it apart into pieces and we end up with a tandem mass spectrum on here on the right-hand side. And simply it's a set of mass intensity tuples. It's a set of, of, those type, of, of that data. And that's what we end up with measuring um, a single molecule. Now, when we take a step back and think about, well, we have a, 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 a biological environmental sample here. It's not just one particular molecule inside of that particular sample. Instead, there's gonna be thousands, tens of thousands um, of different analytes that we wanna measure. Um, and we end up in a typical untargeted experiment of tens of thousands of tandem mass spectra, each of them representing what we think is a unique molecule um, that we've detected in our particular sample. So that's, that's kind of the setup. And so using that data as our intermediary, we still haven't achieved our original goal of being able to tell uh, what is the actual chemical structures that were in the sample uh, originally. Instead, we have all of these tandem mass spectra that represent that, but we wanna convert to something that's a little bit more useful for downstream analysis for chemists and biologists. And so just to give you an idea of the field and how far we've pro progressed in this particular uh, problem, back in 2014, if you took all the public data in the world that we actually have today and we measured the knowledge that we had back then, we could identify maybe less than 1% of all the tandem mass spectra that we collected and be able to say something about what structure was in there. From then until now, so this is a little bit dated from a publication uh, in 2023. To end of 2022, we've drastically increased that. We're still not at 100%. We're definitely not there yet. But at least just taking a looking at the view of all public data in totality, we can start annotating uh, orders of magnitude better. Right? So 13%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 
not great, but we're, we've made huge progress. And so this talk, we're gonna, we're gonna see how do we go from less than 1% up to 13% and the computational techniques uh, that allow us to achieve that. Okay, so just to give you a rough guideline on how we're gonna start thinking about this, we've drawn this kind of oval representing all analytes that we've detected um, in public data. It's about 1 billion tandem mass spectra. Um, so not, not a trivial amount of data, but in general, the, the, there's a small circle here. These are the known compounds that people have detected before. They have taken the time to identify uh, molecules um, and publish a paper, and that, that represents maybe 5 to 15%. There's also this approach about, well, these are the molecules that we know. Perhaps we can start finding related analogs, structural analogs, things that have been metabolized, for example, and taking that core knowledge and expanding it one step. And then the final thing that we're gonna talk about here is how can we start identifying totally new pockets of uh, chemical information? Things that we can't identify right now, but we wanna prioritize them for you know, discovery. And so just, for ex just as examples for collaborations that we've had, things like figuring out all aminoglycoside antibiotics. Can we go to the public data and find all of them, even if we don't know the structure going in? Things like siderophores, these are iron, bind, iron binding molecules or uh, uh, metabolism products uh, of drugs or environmental pollutants as an example, but really start finding new islands of, of chemical space. And so the three ways that we're gonna approach this, first is how do we identify the known molecules so that we don't have to re-identify them. We don't, number two is how can we pro propagate from known to unknown? And number three is how do we start really mining all the public data for uh, new chemical, chemical entities that we might have not discovered that might be interesting um, to some biological system. And so again, let's we take a step back on being able to identify known compounds. Uh, what the, the key goal here is if we have an unknown spectrum here on this left-hand side, unknown tandem mass spectrum, we wanna turn it into a structure. Now, one of the limitations, and it's getting better these days, uh, but it's pretty difficult for us to guess at the fragmentation of how that particular molecule, if we put it into a mass spectrometer, how is it actually going to fall apart in the mass spectrometer? We're not particularly good at that. Um, we can also kind of reverse, and you can do uh, certain things where uh, you, yeah, basically it amounts to figuring out the fragmentation, but we're not particularly good at that. And so one of the things that uh, we do within the field is if we've ever detected this particular molecule on the, on the top right-hand side, um, or we buy a standard and we run it on the mass spectrometer, we save that information. So we, you know, we, we've detected the tandem mass spectrum, we know the 2D structure, let's put it in a database somewhere. And so next time, that we have this unknown spectrum here on the left-hand side, if it looks like something in our database that we've seen before, and we can talk about uh, another discussion about what similar means, but if we look at, uh, if they, they look the same, then we can say, hey, we think it is this, these two are the same molecule, we know the chemical structure, so now we can infer that the molecule that we detected is that chemical structure. So that's a way for us to uh, re-identify known compounds. Now, the real question becomes, where do we get these tandem mass spectral libraries? How do we start creating these databases of tandem mass spectra and known chemical structure? And so we borrowed some ideas um, back in 2014 from resources such as PDB. It's a crowdsourced uh, resource for uh, 3D protein structure. And also another common one that a lot of us are familiar with um, is Wikipedia. And so up until this point, a lot of the spectral libraries were created by singular institutions, primarily the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Um, and you know, they're, they're doing a great job, but there's a single entity. There's thousands of researchers around the world collecting data. Why not tap into that, uh, that collective effort? And so what we did was we built a system um, over at UC San Diego, and this, that allowed everybody in the community to say, hey, here's a tandem mass spectrum, and here's the chemical structure that I figured out. Either I ran a standard in my lab, or I spent uh, a lot of effort figuring out uh, the structure of this particular tandem mass spectrum. 
Originally, we had targeted the natural products community um, just because they spend so much time using NMR, figuring out structures. It's so, it feels so bad to waste that effort. Um, and I think every natural product chemist that I've come across, they've regaled me with tales of they thought they discovered some new antibiotic that was super effective and they thought it was novel. And then six to nine months later, they figure out the structure and it turns out it was discovered in the 70s. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, so at least it prevents that rediscovery wasted effort. And so to date, it's about 600,000 MSMS spectra in the libraries uh, available today. And so this is from uh, hundreds of uh, researchers from around the world. And this resource is publicly available um, and released under a very permissive license for everybody to use. Um, and so uh, just to, one of the things that we wanted to measure is how effective is this crowdsource resource? Is it moving the needle relative to resources such as those coming from NIST? And so what, we're, what we did was we took this library uh, that was crowdsourced and we tried to annotate everything that in the public data. And so this happens to be, I think nowadays, as Nina pointed out, it's like 2,800 data sets. Um, when we made these slides, it's about 2,200. Um, but we were able to search this data and compare the tandem mass spectra and make putative identifications. And so some of these slides are actually a little bit dated um, when the libraries were quite a bit smaller in the original paper. But what happened was uh, we took the crowdsourced libraries, and then back then it was only 19,000 MSMS. Um, compared to resources such as, such as NIST. And what we found was we, the crowdsourced data was able to annotate over 90% of the make, or actually just a bottom line, make 10 times the number of annotations that NIST was able to do. So we're not saying that NIST is doing a particularly bad job, but with, with one of the advantages and one of the hypotheses that we have with the crowdsourcing effort is that people are depositing data for a uh, uh, library spectra for data that they are actually analyzing that is actually appearing in their samples. And so there's a bias towards things that actually exist in real samples. And so that's why we hypothesized that the crowdsourcing effort was able to disproportionately be more useful than commercial libraries produced by, by NIST. And so we thought that was pretty cool. Um, these efforts are paying off. Uh, for the community. And the, the funny thing is that when we try to incentivize people to give data um, to these resources, I will tell you this, nobody does it out of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> Absolutely nobody. Uh, the way we had to sell it was saying, well, okay, sure, screw everybody else. But we wanted to help you. If you deposit your data, you can use the resource to re-identify the same compounds from your lab. So it accelerates your own work. Helping everybody else is a side consequence. I think that kind of resonated with a lot of people uh, as just as, a, as an aside. Um, but one of the things that uh, we also wanted to ask is, and then the same questions pop up in Wikipedia, how reliable is the crowdsourcing effort? Are people just dumping in garbage that's not useful? And so one of the things that we did is because we could re-annotate or we can make putative identifications on all this public data, we have a list of annotations for each, for each file, each, each spectrum, and we can ask the community to come back and ask, especially the, the people who deposit the data who would know it the best, and they would tell us, are these identifications correct in the context of the experiment and your knowledge of the samples? And they would rate it from one star to four star, describing correct or incorrect. And so what we found was uh, compared to things like NIST, the crowdsource libraries were as good or better in terms of the ratings provided by the community. So this is some uh, you know, level of trust uh, afforded by the community. So that gave us confidence that what people were depositing was pretty reasonable. Um, and you know, at least it's a starting point for, for conducting the analysis. But that's not to say it does not replace you know, doing a good follow-up, running standards and things like that. But it's a starting point where you've had nothing, but now you have something to go off of and you can reason about it as a chemist or a biologist. So that's where it brought us to early 2022. All of these efforts by the community and hundreds of groups, we were able to go from less than 1% to about four, four to 5%. Uh, 
If we view it from a full change perspective, huge. If we view it from an absolute number perspective, maybe it's a little disappointing. Um, but so uh, that's where it brings us to the next, the, the next thing, the next frontier, right? So how can we start taking what we know now, one things that we can annotate today and we've seen before and expanding the circle a little bit. And so that's what this uh, little step function here is. We jump from four to 13%. And where is that actually going? And so one of the key intu intuitive ideas that uh, I want to impart to you is if you have two structures, they're not exactly the same. So I've, I don't know if you can see it from the back over there, but they're not exactly the same, but they differ just a little bit. If you put both of these molecules into a mass spectrometer, generally the bond strengths are going to be relatively similar. The fragmentation mechanisms are probably going to be very similar. And so what can you expect about the MSMS spectra that come out, the tandem mass spectra that come out when you put both of these molecules uh, in a mass spectrometer? It's going to be very similar. It might not be exactly the same, but they're going to be very, very similar. And we're going to describe in a toy example, you know, kind of the assumptions around this, but that's, that's kind of the key uh, thought process that I want you to have in your mind. And so again, this is probably gonna uh, make some of the chemists mad on how these are, things are drawn, but it's an illustrative example. So we have here, we have two molecules, one on top, one on the bottom, and they're very similar, except for the one on the bottom has this little structural modification here on the right-hand side. Now, one of the things that you can imagine is you, you break both of these molecules at the same spot. You can see it with this blue dashed line. And on the top, you end up with two pieces, an orange and a purple. And those result in this tandem mass spectrum that we can measure. Now, if you leave this bottom molecule at the same particular spot in this blue dashed line, you end up with a new fragment that's in blue. But you also end up with the same fragment that's in orange. Now, when you start comparing these two spectra, if it does not have the modification on the fragment, they'll stay the same mass. And we can see that this orange peak here it stays the same mass, unless this x-axis is, 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 is mass. But if it contains the modification, if the fragment, the piece that's broken off contains the, frag, uh, the modification, then it will change in mass. And the amount that it changes in mass is exactly equal to the mass of that modification. And so um, one of the things that we can do is we can, we can know the mass of the modification because we can weigh the full molecules, and we can just subtract their full masses if we know that there's a single structural modification. And then what we're able to do is we can do an alignment. We can say this peak here in purple, it can either be at the same mass or it can be a, a shift of this delta. And we can ask that, we can have that hypothesis for every single peak in this top spectrum compared to this bottom spectrum. And we can find and we can make a decision for every peak, should it be shifted or should it not be shifted? And we find the arrangement that maximizes the similarity between these two spectra. And that's how we can define similarity between two similar yet uh, not the same uh, spectra from related molecules. So that's great. So that allows us if there's a single structural modification, right? pretty reasonable uh, approach, hopefully. Now, one of the limitations that we ran into is that, well, what happens if, you're, if you have an unmodified molecule here on the left-hand side and you have a doubly modified molecule here on the right-hand side? If you, do, if you have that and you have this delta and gamma and you fragment the same spot, now neither of uh, the fragments are the same mass and they are shifted by delta plus gamma or a delta and gamma but not delta plus gamma. So when we, we have our original alignment scheme, this doesn't work. So the way that we actually start solving this is that we can devise a fancy computational solution and figuring out all permutations of what delta and gamma could be, or we can think about that biology um, has, that has a solution for us. And so that solution is, these modifications generally don't uh, occur in isolation. A lot of the times what we see is that one of the modification happens and then the second modification happens. And so we can use an intermediate here that is the delta between the left and the middle is a single modification. The delta between the middle and the right-hand side 
is a single modification and allows us to bridge uh, all of these molecules together. And so the particular concepts that we, we, we call this, and when we generalize it to all molecules in a sample, instead of just three, but really create um, uh, a network of these things as we call, call this molecular networking. And so one of the things I wanna highlight here is there was a paper um, published in 2020 um, that was uh, some germ-free versus inoculated mice, I believe. Um, and, but, this, but the point here is this is a molecular network where each circle represents a molecule and a line between them, you can see the light gray here, is that they are, we, we hypothesize they are structurally similar. Um, and so we, or, at the end of the day, this allows us to organize a tandem mass spectra that we've detected, even if we can't identify them into families of putatively related structures. And so just to walk through one particular example, uh, and this is work done by Emily Gentry, and who is a faculty at Virginia Tech now, so definitely reach out to her if you are interested in this. But again, each of these, each of these circles represents a unique molecule in our sample. And the one here on the top, hand, top left hand side is glycocholic acid, so bile acid uh, being produced by the body. Um, and initially, everything else in this family uh, was not, we didn't know what they were. But the molecular networks brought them together so that if we can identify this particular molecule, we can start propagating annotations to related molecules. Um, and it allows us to focus our efforts. And so what Emily was able to do was figure out uh, other bile acids that were conjugated with different amino acids uh, by, by, looking at, by looking at the molecular network and looking at the tandem mass spectra and propagating that annotation. And so there's, there's a lot of chem draw involved from what I understand. Uh, and so she was able to find one that was conjugated with phenylalanine and then one that was conjugated with tyrosine. And so there's a lot of follow-up work on what these might mean biologically, but at the, at the bottom line from an identification standpoint, the networks brought everything together such that she could be able to annotate new structural analogs directly from the tandem mass spectrum. Now, that's just one particular example of how chemists can use uh, molecular networks to organize their data and identify new compounds. But for, as a computer scientist, that is, a little too slow throughput, right? We could do cooler things. And working with Wout um, Bitramu, who is now a faculty at the University of Antwerp, who's a computer scientist, we, what we decided to do was, well, for all the known compounds, we'll have neighbors. Right? We'll have, in this particular example, this is one data set, we'll have one particular neighbor. Can we start automating this propagation effort? Um, but we wanna do it carefully, and, but we also wanna do it on a big scale. And so what we endeavored to do was take all the public data out there and create these molecular networks for each of them so that for the known compounds, we have a neighborhood that we could propagate to. But one of the key things that we wanted to do that allows us to do at these big scales, we, we have thousands of data sets, is we don't wanna just propagate randomly, right? It's like, oh, if we've seen a neighbor once, well, maybe it's spurious. But if we see a neighbor occurring multiple times in multiple data sets. That gives us more confidence that this is actually real. These are actual structural analogs that are um, occurring in multiple data sets. And it gives us the confidence to put together a new library, a new library of putatively propagated molecules um, for people to use. And so that's what we did. We, we ran these networks on all public data and we propagated from known to unknown and we cleaned it up based upon consistency and also the ability to explain some of the structural modifications. And so what the effect, net effect of this was we took about 1.1 billion public tandem mass spectra and that distilled down to about 88,000 putative propagated tandem mass spectra. And these are you know, deduplicated, so it's not the same molecules. And what that allowed us to do was uh, whenever we took that set of data and we tried to identify uh, identify all the public data, it allows us to jump from 4% to 13%. Again, it's disproportionately useful because we could draw, this data was drawn from real data out there. So we know it actually occurs rather than simply running standards that are easy to acquire. And so a 15% growth 
in the size of the spectral libraries uh, yielded about a 400% growth in annotation rates. So it's, it's another way that we are you know, hacking away at uh, the annotation problem um, using big data. Okay, so that's, that, that covers the first two sections that really rely on um, annotations uh, and spectral libraries. And then the third point is how can we start making use of this other 87% of the data by leveraging uh, computational tools as well as what chemists, the chemists built up knowledge in their, in their heads. And so uh, I just wanna start with the, or yeah, so that's the, that's the background, but I wanna start with a little vignette. Um, it, it kind of, it paints chemists in a good and bad light, I would say. Um, so working with Peter, we're, we're very good friends and he's a, he's a mass spectrometrist and a, a, and, a, and a chemist. And he, you know, we, we, we chat all the time and he, he asked me, I guess this is a couple of, time flies, I guess, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And we have all of this public data out there, um, you know, thousands of data sets, billions of uh, MS and MS spectra. And he says, okay, uh, can we find all the carnitine molecules in this data? Kind of a throwaway question. Maybe that's what PIs do. <laughs> and I, at the time, you know, I'm a computer scientist, but I know a little bit about chemistry. And one of the things that I know is that um, certain molecules um, and certain portions of the molecules will, will imprint uh, a pattern in the mass spectrometry data. Right? Whether it's based on composition, it might have a specific unique isotopic pattern. If there's a structural moiety that's interesting, there might be some distinctive uh, peaks in the tandem mass spectrometry. So I know, I know a little bit about this. And um, for the carotene example, I know, well, if you do tandem mass, spe uh, do tandem mass uh, spectrum measurement, um, there's like this uh, 85 Dalton peak or like a 59 neutral loss. So I, I know some of this, I can, you know, I write some code. Um, it's like, okay, we can look for that exact pattern in the public data. Maybe that's, that's a way we can achieve this, this question. If it has those two data features, that's high likelihood that it's a carotene. And we can scale this out to all data and you shepherd the, 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 the computational cluster to make sure it works once um, to get you the results. Now, like, a, you know, you give a mouse a cookie, uh, they'll want to do all these molecules, right? So, of course, the next question is, oh, great, but we can do that. Let's do these other things and figure out the chemical diversity of all these classes of compounds. Um, we could do one, why not, why, why not do a lot? And so given this kind of request, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I don't wanna do any effort. As a computer scientist, I think the, the, the key trait is we are, we're lazy. And so the question that I want to pose is, or at the, at the time is, can we create some sort of universal computational solution that chemists can do, right? You know, there's a, there's a skill gap between uh, computer scientists, we have what we do, and a lot of chemists, what, what they're good at, and writing tool, writing software that scales to big, big data is not a particular skill that chemists probably possess. Um, so, but the answer is, I think there, there might be a solution to all this. And so one of the things that we created is called the mass spec query language. And this is probably something people are already doing manually every day, very slowly, and it kills me. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that it's understandable. It needs to be a language that allows chemists to read and write it very naturally in the way that they're already thinking about the data. It needs to be flexible. It needs to describe all the full complexity of patterns that people are already looking for today. And based on, on mass spec and mass spec adjacent. So retention time, ion mobility. It needs to be scalable. This really is... Uh, at least when you write a, when we write the paper, that's the main selling point. But I will admit it's still useful even if it's a single file because looking through 10,000 spectra for a graduate student, it's not the, you know, for anybody actually, it's not the fastest thing in the world. Um, and it also needs to be reusable. If people are going to describe what they're looking for, well, wouldn't it be great instead of describing somebody in a sentence and training an undergrad, you can just give them some sort of codified pattern and it's easily reproducible and it's also uh, a distillation of chemistry knowledge. So those are kind of the four pillars 
um, that, that we use to design this particular language. So just to give you an idea of being understandable. So it's, you know, sort of like English. Um, and it, for those of you that are computational oriented, it's got a lot of inspirations from uh, SQL, which is a database language. Um, but here on the top hand side, we call it MassQL. And you can say, for example, I'm looking for MS2 spectra. And here's the English and we, we actually translate to several different languages. And then you can add clauses say, well, in the MS2 spectra, it needs to have this particular peak with this particular tolerance. And you can start putting uh, multiple conditions together. Right, an arbitrary number of conditions to give you more specificity. And this is the most simple example, um, but uh, this makes it very easy for, if, you want, if you're entering this for the first time to understand what does this actually mean? So you have some translators to English um, and Portuguese. But as a side note, just this became rel more relevant the last year is uh, what if you don't wanna learn MassQL? Perhaps you don't wanna learn MassQL. So if you wanna write it in English, uh, ChatGPT4 does quite good of a job of translating from whatever English you write uh, back to mask. It's honestly very impressive. Um, but anyway, if you want to play with that, let me know. Um, so that's so hopefully it's easy to understand. Um, a lot of the trials with new chemists getting them on board, five minutes, they're off to the races. So number two, it needs to be flexible. It needs to describe everything that you all want to find. Um, and so just to give you a kind of a taste, again, this is still a subset of what it supports. If you want to uh, say there's a particular peak, great, you can find, you can, you can sp start specifying that. If there's a neutral loss from the precursor, you can start specifying that. If there's a mass delta between any two peaks in the spectrum, you can start specifying that. Or if there's relative peak intensities that might tell you something, for example, isotopic uh, envelopes, you can start specifying that. And you can combine any of these uh, with conjunctions to increase specificity. And once you've written it, you can apply this not only onto a single file, but you can just say, here's an entire data or an entire repository that I want to throw this search out to. So I think that's, that's kind of the, one of the cool parts. So just to give you an anecdote uh, with a collaborator, uh, Daniel Petrich from Tubing, and so he's more of a mass spectrometrist and natural product chemist. And so he really cared about this particular natural product um, that's an NRPS PKS hybrid. And he knew that it produced a 468 and 660 MO RISD uh, fragment for this type and this family of natural products. And so he was able to very quickly write this particular query, not the most fancy thing, but, uh, but just as an illustration. Um, and, what, and this was what he was able to find um, in his data because he had published this data and discovery of these uh, natural products back in 2017. And so within an afternoon, we were able to recapitulate and find this whole family of molecules that he had already published and we did it much, much faster. So cool, but what was more interesting is that not only were we able to re-identify the, the albicidin molecules that he had discovered, we were able to discover more putative albicidin family members using MassQL and molecular networking. And so just as an example, in blue here are all of the ones that were identified uh, in his original publication and in gray, these are new putative albicidin analogs. And so uh, kind of a, one of the advantages of doing it with MassQL as opposed to looking at it manually is it, it's much more thorough and it's much more consistent. And I'm, and I'm sure like just the, the manual efforts, a lot of things fall through the cracks, but this allows us to really be more sensitive to find exactly what we want to find. And so not that he's gonna follow up and publish a paper saying describing these other analogs, but this shows the principle of, well, if you're gonna you look for something, look for something, right? So, and so this third point here is about scalability. And so that was just one data set, a few, uh, a few uh, LCMS files. So not the biggest thing in the world, but scalability wise, there's absolutely no way anybody's gonna start looking through a billion tandem mass spectra for a particular pattern manually. And so here's one illustrative example um, from Nina Zhao at UCSD. And so she was interested in these organophosphate esters. And so these are uh, flame retardants. So she really cared about runoff into waterways and understanding, you know, what are the molecules that are flowing into the waterway that are uh, of this class of compound. And so the, the point is that there's a large diversity of these types of compounds, but uniquely for at least uh, phosphates, 
is that there's a dis there's a distinctive fragmentation that's 98.98 and really easy. And so what Nino is able to do was again write a particular query, not the most fancy thing. And she was also able to say it's 98.98, but also it needs to be the most intense peak in the spectrum. So that's some sort of domain knowledge that she injected in because she's worked with these molecules before. And so what we're able to do is we take all the public data, we apply her particular query against it, and we filter down from 1.1 billion down to 338,000 tandem mass spectrum. Still, this is quite a lot um, to go through, but we you know, take some of the tools that we talked about in this earlier in this talk, and we merge all identical tandem mass spectra to do deduplication and we group them up using molecular networking into families of related compounds. And so the net result of this is just as illustration here on the left-hand side is a family of organophosphate esters in uh, uh, red here are the ones that we know and blue here are the ones that we don't, we can't identify to libraries. So there's a lot that we can't identify, but Nina is able to go through this data and um, what she was able to do was number one, similar to Daniel, she had published about these organophosphate esters several years ago. And these results, she was able to find some new putative organophosphate esters from her own data that she didn't publish on, um, that she had missed. But uniquely, she was also able to find new organophosphate esters from public data that was not in her own. So really expanding the chemical diversity that she was able to observe um, and put together here. And so, you know, as, as one kind of uh, idea is if you can define these patterns, you can now start, and if you search all public data, you can start defining the breadth of chemical diversity within a particular class without even identifying the molecule. So it gives you a playground to, uh, to discover new chemistry. So we think that's, that's kind of interesting, or at least I hope it's interesting. Okay, so uh, the final bit, is that these, these queries are reusable. And so you saw that, you know, it's a pretty succinct sentence, um, but one of the things that we wanna do, uh, or we have been doing, is that if people write these queries, and it's, it takes a lot of knowledge to write a good one, um, you wanna be able to save that somewhere. So whether, whether it's sharing it within an organization or across the community, we've created a compendium where people can upload these queries, they can describe it, and, uh, you, it's, easy, it's very easy to pull one off the shelf and actually start applying it to your data. And so one of the key things is while we have created MassQL as a language, we've also created the software infrastructure around it to really make it go. So that if you write a MassQL query, you can actually practically search it on your own data. And so for, from the software engineering side, we have a Python and R API that supports MassQL. And so then we have, we take those and we support that in the platforms that uh, we run as web services. But also, and I think this is the, the really important point, is that we've collaborated with a lot of the leading open source uh, uh, scientists out there in the metabolomics field. And what they have done is they've implemented MassQL directly in their software. So for example, MZMine, Open, uh, OpenMS, MS Dial, these are some of the, the largest and most used software packages uh, in the field. And so if you write a MassQL query once, you can use that same query in any of these softwares on the same data or new data and roughly expect the same results. This is a difference from having to figure out how to use their distinctive UI and telling somebody else how to do it to get to the same result. This is one, one way to uh, create reproducibility across many different software packages. And so we've been very fortunate um, to have that. And also, I think I missed a logo here. It's also being adopted uh, in uh, instrument vendor software. So Bruker, Bruker's Metabloscape has started supporting this as well. So we're seeing wide adoption throughout the field. And so taking this back to where we started is, can we find all these things? And broadly, the answer, I think, is yes. And so I don't think I'm spoiling too much, but Peter's lab has really taken this idea and they write their own queries, mine all this data. I don't have to do anything. It's amazing. So, um, and so just to take us back, the very first section of this talk, we were able to figure out ways to crowdsource and, uh, and collaboratively create a knowledge base to identify known compounds that the community has seen before. We were able to computationally expand that knowledge with alignment and molecular networking. 
And then we were able to figure out ways to find pockets of interesting chemistry that you know, everyday users can start defining with MassQL. Um, and all this work, you know, definitely could not have done without great collaborators, definitely my, uh, my students at UC Riverside, um, as well as uh, my mentors and collaborators at UCSD and, you know, and, and definitely the funders. And throughout my career, honestly, I've been very fortunate to uh, work with a great group of individuals and I think Nino's mentioning, there's a lot of papers um, that I, I've been fortunate to be on, but in all honesty, I don't do anything. Uh, they do all the work and um, that's, I'm, I'm very thankful for, for having such a fortunate career so far. So anyway, happy to take any questions and thank you all for your attention. As per seminar tradition, we do like to take our first question from a trainee. So anybody would like to start off the question session? Okay. <laughs> um, this is, listening to this, this is kind of reminding me of combi chem or like combinatorial chemistry, which is like, um, uh, like about a decade or two decades ago, it was like, the promise of like using synthetic chemistry to, to predict and produce new pharmaceuticals. And they thought it was gonna be like this great new thing. Um, and this seems like a more practical, um, have, do you, are you familiar with like Tommy Chem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, high levels, high levels of it, yeah. yeah. Um, so do you, do you think that like this, like molecular networking of finding similar structures based on existing natural products and, and identifying unknowns this way. Do you think this is kind of more promising or able to deliver on the promises of um, become or like completely synthetic um, uh, generating new compounds? Probably not from the goals of combi camera are just to kind of really explore that chemical space. Here, I think with molecular networking, one of the key things is you want to detect what's there, right? There's thousands of molecules, there's tens of thousands of molecules that are there. It's, it becomes a question of prioritization, right? So how do you follow up and figure out something new to discover and, and focus your effort? Because discovering a new molecule is not the most easy thing in the world, right? And so um, I think, I, w I don't want to say it delivers on any promises because it depends on what the promise is, but um, at least so far, chemists have been able to use the tools to drastically accelerate uh, the prioritization process, right? They're like, oh, there's, a, there's an analog that's similar to this known one. Okay, I'm gonna spend some effort. I'm gonna isolate it. I'm gonna purify it and, and, and do it no more. Um, now, I, I think there's a, I just wanna mention, uh, it's not exactly your question, but I wanna mention, uh, there's a new paper coming out uh, from Emily Gentry. Uh, it's called, it's, it combines, you, you mentioned combi so I'm gonna bring it up. Mm -hmm. And so what they did there was they applied these some combinatorial chemistry principles where you could take some sort of some scaffold, you know, create all, all these different variants, measure on the mass spec. Most of them are not real, right? The, the nature of biology would never make them. But you can ask the question, is it real? So you can make, let's say, 10,000 analogs. You can compare it to all the public data and find the intersection of that combinatorial space with real biological space. And then that's a vehicle to identify unknown. So it, it, that's coming, it just got accepted. So it'll be coming on in a few weeks, hopefully, so. Well, again, this is sort of question as well as the suggestion. I mean, you talk a lot about uh, chemistry is the, uh, the knowledge to enhance the prediction, the, the ability to predict the chemical structures and but have you thought about actually incorporating the really inco the increasing knowledge in the sort of comparative genomics and uh, metabolic pathway? So look at, so think about in the, here is the, the microbiome community. If you know what microbes or organisms exist in a given sample, you can sort of almost guess what kind of metabolic capacity they can carry. Right. So can you use to incorporate the known metabolic capacity data into your tool to sort of create a certain boundaries. That's like a, you right. use the right, right, right. 
fragmentation patterns and the multiplication pattern to increase the ability to break the structure, you can also bring the metabolic capacity based on what organism exists in a particular sample, right? So yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So I think some of the this work of of uh, uh, has been done by JGI. I don't know if you yeah. know Trent and Ben. Yeah. Um, so they, they have a tool called Magi that that goes into along these lines where given uh, some knowledge about yeah the genes and and the enzymes that and what they can do, mm -hmm. you can start constraining, uh, for example, like the molecular networks, right? If you say there's a molecule and then there's an oxidized version of them, what we think is an oxidized version, like 16 Daltons. Mm -hmm. If there is an enzyme that can do oxidation on that particular substrate, then that's one way to, to increase the higher probability of that being true. And so that's, that's a, I think that's a pretty good idea. Now, the ability to predict that something can, you know, the activity of a particular enzyme, especially if it's a pretty novel system, it's probably not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but I, I would say like the, I think that's probably the, the way to go, especially if you're trying to discover something new. I was thinking about, so as I was listening to your talk, I was sort of imagining the early days of uh, genomics. Mm -hmm. Basically, when so we sequenced a few genomes, it was difficult to predict what they are. Mm -hmm. But as we add more data, it becomes easier and easier to predict the, the newly sequenced the genes and genomes. Mm -hmm. So again, the, what I was thinking is that, so, so you have to sort of combine with a biological experiment in a certain sense that maybe start with a phylogenetically positioned organism and what gene they encode for the metabolic capacity mm -hmm. and then what kind of metabolite they can potentially produce. So can we sort of starting from those uh, uh, pockets of a core, the in-depth analyzed organism of metabolism and then just try to expand on. I, so, just, no, no, actually this is, uh, I think, thank you for, uh, you know, particularly anymore. I think there's a, from the natural product space, there's some work from uh, Medi, I think his last name is Medi, he's in France. And so their approach is, it's kind of similar to as you're describing where imagine that you have a known molecule mm -hmm. and you have some enzymes. It's, yeah. it's a much simpler system yeah. than microbiomes, but, and they say, okay, we know that this enzyme can add a hydroxyl group. Mm -hmm. Let's permute, let's see, that's, yeah. the, that's the search space, right? Yeah. And then you progressively can start expanding given that, given that sort of knowledge. So they've, they've done some of this. I think they published this in 2019. I think the thing that's holding a lot of us back there is a lot of the tools to say this chemical structure and this tandem mass spectra are the same. They're very bad, or at least back then they were very bad, but they're accelerating. I think we're getting to a point where, where what you're describing could be possible. So it's, it's interesting, it's very interesting. Yes. Oh, I was curious, uh, the bump that you saw up to 13%, mm -hmm. um, can you comment if it happens to be biased by certain underlying chemical scaffolds? Uh, because one would imagine that there's certain data types that are much more common than others. Right, I don't, I cannot comment on that. I should, you know, we just, I gotta look back at the paper. Um, but it will probably, let me think. Like maybe to frame it differently, like what is the chemical diversity in that bump? Like, are they right, highly new? related what's... compounds or are they really diverse? Um, it'll be a reflection upon the identified compounds, right? It's going to be neighbors of the identified compounds. Now, asking the question about which kinds of compounds would have a lot of chemical diversity around it, that's probably the more interesting part about it. So I, I, I need to get back to you on that. I need to get back to you on that. Um, I still don't even know how to frame that particular question as a computer scientist, but I'll 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 ask some of the chemists. But like, what are the classes that we're seeing a lot more diversity versus um, uh, not? Yes. So I have two questions. One I think is more difficult than the other, but um, so I'm I'm curious about your nomenclature related to those associated compounds. So I'm assuming that you have these compounds that you have identified and you have names right. on them and then you have this cloud of compounds how how are those names it's very similar to taxonomy for right organisms and right. so i'm curious how you're doing that. right so there's there's different stages of all this right so um whenever so in the, this when we're starting to do the propagations and we have to create a library 
we do need to name it something, right? When we create the networks, we can just say, hey, it's a neighbor. We don't, we present it to a chemist, we don't have to say anything. But one of the things that we do is we can say, it's a neighbor. We don't know the full chemical structure. And we can say, we think there's a difference of this formula. And that's, that's kind of the limitation, right? It's kind of more natural as opposed to actually describing the full chemical, like, this, like the 2D structure. Now, this is, I mean, I like your question mostly because our lab is working on that question of imagine you do have a neighbor and it's unknown, but it's related to something that is known. So can you say something about where the modification occurs, right? So this is a site localization question for let's say a, a hydroxyl group, right? And it's right now we say that the nomenclature that we use basically says it can occur anywhere on the molecule, you can attach it anywhere. But the next step will be to say, given the information richness in the tandem aspect, it, it's, just in, it's in this pocket, right? Or this region. We might not be able to nail it down to this, the exact atom and get the full 2D structure, but at least we encapsulate the ambiguity and say what we can. So I think that's, that's where we're going, um, but we're not there. We're not quite there yet. And that's actually in the name if I were to search. Right. Yeah, you, I believe so. I have to look back at, at it, but it's, it's something you could say like uh, analog of X, and then it would you, you could find that. So, so my second question is, how do you go from 13 to 30 percent? Right. So I think there's several there's several strategies here. So number one, um, things we probably can already do. So one of the things that we have in mass spectrometry is there's a lot of uh, artifacts. So kind of liquid chromatography and, and mass spec um, artifacts. And so one mall. So we made some simplifying assumptions earlier. But one molecule does not generate one tandem mass spectrum. And in, in the small molecule space, one molecule can have different versions. So we call them adducts. And those are in the system being called as different analytes, right? Whereas they should be kind of collapsed together. Um, and within the libraries, we don't actually have all of the versions of that particular metabolite, but there are ways to computationally recover these things. And so that's probably, that probably already gets us 30, even probably even a little higher than 30%. Um, now beyond that, some of the areas of active research are, we know that the, the libraries of tandem mass spectra and, and chemical structures, they're incomplete. If you just go look at PubChem, it's like hundred million structures. And if you look at the number of structures here, it's like 25,000, right? So there's a huge order of magnitude difference. And so, Machine learning is kind of coming into play now where you can start predicting the fragmentation and you can start you know, predicting the structure directly from tandem aspect. Um, and so those are the areas that it's, that's, that's kind of the, the next hurdle. Now the question is, is the information content rich enough uh, in the tandem aspect to fully get at the, the structure? We'll see, um, but that's, that's where we're going. And so one of the things is, you know, Back 10 years ago, you just didn't have any data you could build these machine learning models on. But now, after like the community putting all this effort into these resources, well, now you, you kind of have that ability to start, you have enough data where your models are not totally crap. So um, so that's that's probably that's probably some of the, the next frontier um, areas. Um, but we'll see, we'll see. And with that question, uh, the seminar uh, noon. So for those of you who are uh, somewhere else, you can see.